Today I am going to talk about the importance of particle size. My name is Tom Peters. I am a professor at the University of Iowa. By the end of this module, learners should be able to describe how forces that cause a particle to move in air depend strongly on particle size, predict the behavior of a particle based on size, relate particle size to adverse health effects, and explain why personal samplers use health relevant size criteria. The source of an aerosol defines its size and concentration as we have seen in a previous module. Remember that we have expressed an aerosol by different metrics, number, surface area, or mass concentration by particle size. Hot sources create vapors that nucleate or condense to form particles typically smaller than one micrometer in diameter, known as nano, ultrafine, and fine particles. Welding and combustion engines produce these type of particles that we know of as fume, smokes, and smog. They dominate particle number concentration and can be an important component of mass distributions. In contrast, mechanical sources break up bulk material into coarse particles that are primarily larger than one micrometer such as in grinding or sanding. These aerosols we know as mists, dusts, and sprays. They often dominate particle mass distributions but contribute little to particle number concentration. We must consider several very important forces and phenomena that dictate how particles behave. These include gravity, inertia, Brownian motion, electrical attraction, adhesion and detachment, and coagulation. As we will see, their importance depends heavily on particle size. These forces and phenomena dictate how particles move from source to sink. They also dictate how air cleaners like filters work and what types of disease develop and in what parts of the respiratory tract. Let's first consider the force of gravity which leads to gravitational settling. Consider this orange spherical particle suspended in air. I know from experience that there is a force of gravity that pulls the particle to Earth. If I dig back to my physics from high school, I can recall that the force of gravity is equal to mass times gravity, which can then be expressed as the volume of the particle times density of the particle times g, the gravitational constant. I can then express volume of the particle, assuming that it's a sphere, as pi divided by 6 times diameter cubed. The vertical downward motion caused by gravity is resisted by the force of drag. Drag can be expressed as constants 3 times pi times air viscosity times particle diameter times terminal settling velocity. As shown in the yellow box, I can equate the force of gravity due to the force of drag using Newton's second law. I then solve for terminal settling velocity. Now, the details of the derivation of this equation are not so important. However, it is really important to be able to look at an equation and get a feel for how this particle dictates particle behavior under the influence of gravity. In this case, terminal settling is directly proportional to particle density and particle diameter squared. In parentheses, I symbolically represent this relationship with the proportionality symbol followed by the symbol for particle density, a Greek rho, and particle size squared. I don't need to worry about constants such as the gravitational constant unless I go to another planet or fluid viscosity if we are dealing with air at standard temperature and pressure. This relationship tells us that a more dense particle like lead will settle faster than a less dense one, like pollen. Does this make sense? Every time you see an equation, you should be able to take and look at the proportionality of it, and then ask yourself, do these things make sense? In this case, yeah, sure, it makes sense. A less dense particle will settle slower than a more dense one. It also says that a larger particle will settle a lot faster than a smaller one, because terminal settling velocity is proportional to particle diameter squared. I used the equation that we just came up with for terminal settling velocity to prepare this table for different size silica particles. I chose silica because of its importance 
as a health hazard in many industries, such as construction and metal casting. The first two columns show particle diameter in micrometers and nanometers. Column 3 shows particle terminal settling velocity in meters per second. And the last two columns provide the distance fallen in meters. And because I'm a product of the English system, the last column provides feet. As shown in the yellow box, upper right, the distance fallen was calculated as the settling velocity multiplied by the time allowed to settle, which in this example is one minute. Distance fallen in one minute is also shown graphically at the bottom of the slide. These graphics help us understand how particle size is important to gravity settling. Particles smaller than one micrometer settle only a small distance. For example, the one micrometer particle settles 0.003 meters or 3 millimeters in one minute. The fact that settling velocity increases with diameter squared dramatically changes how far a particle settles in one minute. Silica particle with a diameter of 10 micrometers will settle at a rate of one foot per minute, which is an old rule of thumb used by industrial hygienists. The 100 micrometer particle settles 98 feet in a minute. That is a big difference, and that's all because settling velocity is a function of diameter squared. Industrial settling chambers are sometimes used to clean dusty air with very large particles. The settling chamber consists of a box that is large enough to slow the particle-laden air. Large particles settle under the influence of gravity and are collected in hoppers at the bottom of the chamber. Small particles pass along with the airflow and out of the device. A drawback of these devices is that they have to be very large to obtain high efficiencies, but they can be very effective when they're used as pre-cleaners to improve the lifespan of more efficient cleaners that are downstream. A vertical elutriator is a device that relies on gravity settling. It is used in cotton dust sampling to remove large cotton particles with no health relevance, approximately 15 micrometers in size before particles are collected onto a filter. Only those particles with a settling velocity less than the upward movement of air can reach the filter. Thus, as can be seen in the plot, particles smaller than 15 micrometers collect on the filter with high efficiency, whereas larger particles fall out of the device and have low collection efficiency. Let's consider inertial forces now that act on a, a particle, which leads to impaction, like a bug hitting the windshield of a car. The windshield causes air to move up and over the car. The force of drag will cause a small bug to follow the airflow over the car, avoiding the windshield. In contrast, a big bug, like a grasshopper, resists drag because of its inertia. If the inertia of the big bug is sufficient, it deviates away from the airflow to hit the windshield and make a big mess. This process is called inertial impaction. The concepts of particle relaxation time and stopping distance are used to describe inertial forces. The particle relaxation time is how long it takes a particle to relax to its new conditions. It is proportional to particle density and diameter squared, which is exactly the same as we saw before with terminal settling velocity. The stopping distance is the distance that the particle will move along its original direction until it relaxes to the new conditions. It is calculated as the initial velocity times the particle relaxation time. In the figure from the video, the small bug has little inertia. It relaxes fast to new conditions having a short relaxation time, or tau, and thus moves only a short distance toward the windshield, having a short stopping distance, and it passes over the car without hitting the windshield. In contrast, the big bug has lots of inertia. It is slow to relax, has a long relaxation time, has a large stopping distance, so it moves away from the airflow streamlines and hits the windshield. So now we can use these relationships to compute something a bit more related to occupational health, such as how far will a silica particle be thrown from a grinder?
going back to the same table that we used previously with particle diameter in micrometers and nanometers in the first two columns, the middle column shows particle relaxation time, tau, in seconds. The last two columns show the distance thrown, or stopping distance, in both meters and feet. Small particles relax very fast. It's only until we get to the largest particles where we get appreciable movement. A 10 micrometer particle is thrown only 0 0.02 feet, which is about a quarter of an inch. In contrast, a 100 micrometer particle would be thrown much farther, about two feet. So the eye protection required for the worker shown in the picture is to prevent ocular damage from impact of very large particles. Inertial impactors use this inertial property of aerosols to remove large particles from an airflow. Air is forced through a nozzle which accelerates the air into an air jet. The air jet impinges on an impactor plate causing the jet to abruptly turn 90 degrees. Small particles with little inertia relax to the change in direction and pass around the plate often to be collected on a filter. Large particles, in contrast, have enough inertia to hit the plate and be removed from the air. In this way, small particles can be analyzed separately from larger particles. Impactors are usually characterized by collection efficiency by particle size, such as shown in the upper right. Large particles hit the plate almost every time, having a plate collection efficiency of near 100 percent. Small particles, in contrast, almost never hit the plate as they flow with the airflow, having a low particle collection efficiency. The particle diameter for which 50 percent of the particles collect is often referred to as the particle cutoff diameter and used to describe impactor performance. The light blue personal environmental monitor shown in the lower right is designed to collect particles smaller than 2.5 microns onto a filter after an impactor section that removes particles larger than 2.5 microns. Cyclones are another type of important device that use inertial impaction to separate large particles from an airstream. The airflow enters a cyclone and spins several complete turns before exiting. Large particles hit the walls of the cyclone and move to a chamber at the bottom of the device called a grit pot. Small particles remain airborne and pass out of the cyclone. Respirable cyclones are commonly used as lapel type samplers to measure particle exposures with the smaller particles that can enter the deep lung exiting the cyclone and collected onto a filter for subsequent analysis. Air is pulled through the cyclone using a belt-mounted air sampling pump. Industrial cyclones for air cleaning can be very large and serve to remove large particles nominally larger than 10 micrometers or so before being exhausted in dusty industries such as woodworking. Now we will consider Brownian motion, which leads to diffusion. So far we've been discussing large particles like the green 10 micrometer particle shown on the right hand side of the slide. Very different forces are important for small particles that approach the size of gas molecules like the red 5 nanometer particle shown in the slide. These particles randomly jitter because of the bombardment of gas molecules. This movement is called Brownian motion and is important for particles smaller than about 100 nanometers. Brownian motion leads to diffusion, which is the net movement of particles away from where they started. Brownian motion is characterized by the diffusion coefficient, capital D. Shown in the equation in the yellow box, the diffusion coefficient is directly proportional to the fluid temperature and inversely proportional to particle diameter. So if the particle temperature increases, gas molecules move faster and the diffusion coefficient becomes larger and the particle will jitter more. Unlike other forces that we have seen so far, Brownian motion is inversely proportional to particle diameter. Thus this equation tells us that smaller particles will jitter more due to Brownian motion than larger ones. 
Brownian motion causes particles to be displaced. Consider, for example, if we line up a bunch of particles at time zero and then allow them to randomly jitter. After some time, these particles become displaced away from the center, randomly moving in any direction. The net displacement can be expressed as the root mean square displacement, which is simply the square root of two times the diffusion coefficient times time. Shown in the table at the lower right, a small particle, like a five nanometer particle, will have a large diffusion coefficient and therefore a large displacement due to diffusion. Whereas a larger particle, say 300 nanometers, will have negligible displacement. If we look at this equation, the more time we give diffusion, the more displacement we'll have. To get a better feeling for how particle size dictates what forces are important, let's compare how far a silica particle moves in one minute due to Brownian motion and gravity settling. Again, I show particle diameter in micrometers and in nanometers in the first two columns. Then I provide displacement in one minute due to Brownian motion in column three and that due to gravity settling in column four. Finally, in the rightmost column, I show the ratio of these displacements, that due to Brownian motion, divided by that due to gravity settling. The force of gravity dominates for particles larger than one micrometer, whereas the force of Brownian motion dominates for particles smaller than 100 nanometers. For a 10 nanometer sized particle, Brownian motion causes 424 times more displacement than gravity. However, the distance moved in one minute is still very small. 0.002 meters or 2 millimeters. To put things in further perspective, we need to change the scale of things that we are considering. So here for this plot, on the y-axis, I show the distance the particle is displaced in one minute, but instead of showing this data in meters, I show it in micrometers. The x-axis is particle diameter that we are familiar with. For perspective, I add that the mean diameter of a human alveolus is 200 micrometers. Again, we can see that for particles smaller than 100 nanometers, diffusion dominates over gravity settling. These particles, if allowed to stay in the alveolar region for one minute, will likely be displaced a sufficient distance to hit the wall of the human alveolus. Diffusion can be used to remove small particles by passing a particle-laden airstream through a screen. Brownian motion causes the smallest particles, say with a diameter of 10 nanometers, to jitter more than medium-sized particles, say a 100 nanometer-sized particle. The smallest particles, therefore, have a high probability of hitting and collecting on the screen, having a high collection efficiency. In contrast, the medium-sized particles tend to follow the airflow, pass through the screen with low collection efficiency. In my laboratory, we have used a combination of inertial devices and diffusion screens to develop what we call the Personal Nanoparticle Respiratory Deposition Sampler, or NRD sampler. The motivation for this work was to measure nanoparticle exposures separately from larger particles in a workplace because sometimes nanoparticles have more biological activity than other airborne particles, even if they're made from the same material. In this device, particles enter a respirable cyclone, which removes the largest dust, nominally that larger than four micrometers, and may cause downstream components to fail. An impactor then removes particles larger than 300 nanometers, leaving only the smallest particles airborne. Then a series of diffusion screens collect nanoparticles with the efficiency that mimics deposition in the human respiratory system. These nanoparticles can then be analyzed separately from other airborne particles. The entire sampler can be worn on the lapel and works with traditional belt-mounted air sampling pumps and analysis can be done by traditional analytical chemistry methods. 
Electrostatic forces cause the particle to be attracted or repelled to other objects, such as a fiber used in a respirator. These forces can affect any size particle, and just like magnets, like charges repel and opposite charges attract. These forces can be very important, but a detailed description is beyond the scope of this course. However, I will give some examples later of how electrostatic forces can be used to improve the efficiency of filters. The forces that cause particles to adhere or detach from a surface are important in determining the stickiness of a particle. Adhesion, primarily due to van der Waals force, is an important force that is proportional to particle diameter. This force also goes up with relative humidity. You can understand that as things get stickier when they're wet. Detachment is proportional to particle diameter squared or particle diameter cubed. If we consider a particle on a filter being shipped by FedEx, larger particles will have much greater likelihood of falling off the filter because they have more weight and want to keep moving when a shipping box comes to an abrupt stop as the package hits the ground. Air currents also can pick up particles such as wind-blown dust from a stand pile. The net result is this. The force of adhesion is fairly moderate with all size particles. However, detachment forces are much stronger for large particles. Consequently, nanoparticles stick really well and particles larger than 10 micrometers detach from things really, really easily. Now we're going to consider coagulation, another important phenomenon for nanoparticles when particle concentrations are very high. In this plot, I show the evolution of particle number concentration in number of particles per centimeter cubed by particle size. One centimeter cubed is about the size of the tip of your thumb. For reference, the number concentration of particles in a typical office are about 10,000 or 10 raised to the 4 particles per centimeter cubed. Consider a small aerosol at very high concentration, like that shown in the figure, the 10 nanometer sized particle with a concentration of 100 million or 10 raised to the 8 particles per centimeter cubed at time zero. These particles have a high probability of hitting each other for two reasons. First, they are very close together because they are highly concentrated, and second, they tend to jitter around a lot because of Brownian motion. We also know that adhesion is very strong for nanoparticles, so they tend to stick when they do hit. All of these things together cause the particle to become larger with time, forming chain structures, and the concentration to decrease because multiple particles combine to become one. Here I show one of my favorite examples of the net result of coagulation. I collected the particles shown in these transmission electron microscope images while cutting a metal ventilation duct with a plasma torch. It's hard to see the particles at a magnification of 6300x at left. However, when you zoom in a hundred thousand times at right, you can see that particles have a beautiful chain or fractal structure. This particle formed by several key steps. First, the heat of the plasma torch vaporized the metal. The metal then nucleated as it cooled in the room to form 10 nanometer sized metal particles. The concentration was so high that the particle hit each other and stuck together forming what we call a chain agglomerate. This type of structure is very typical of hot processes. Coagulation can also be seen in these important measurements made near a freeway in Los Angeles. Near the freeway, 30 meters away as highlighted in red, there were many very small particles that were freshly generated by vehicle combustion. These particles occurred at such high concentrations that they hit each other, stuck, and formed larger particles as they moved away from the source, as shown in blue 150 meters away from the freeway. Based on these measurements, legislation was enacted to prevent schools from being built near freeways in an effort to reduce ultrafine exposures among children. The forces and phenomena that we have just discussed are crucial in understanding aerosol behavior in a variety of important settings, such as in the collection of particles by filters. In filters, 
dirty air passes through a filter and comes out clean. As you may have guessed, particle size plays an important role in the collection efficiency, with some particles hitting the filter and being collected while other particles pass through. For a moment, I want us to consider a single fiber in the filter. The airflow bends as it moves around the fibers, much like the airflow moving up and over a car on the highway. Large particles have a high probability of hitting the fiber because inertia causes them to deviate from the airflow streamlines. Small particles, in red, also have a high probability of hitting the fiber because of Brownian motion. However, medium-sized particles, in orange, typically around 300 nanometers in diameter, are affected minimally by diffusion or inertia and go with the flow, following the streamlines to the other side of the filter. The combined effect of diffusion and impaction results in a collection efficiency curve that is typical of filters and other devices, as we'll see. Here I show particle collection efficiency by size for two different kinds of filters. The purple curve is typical of a low efficiency filter, like a low cost furnace filter. High collection efficiency is achieved for very small particles, say 10 nanometers in size, due to diffusion and for large particles, larger than say 5 micrometers due to impaction. However, the lowest collection efficiencies occur for particles in the middle size range, about 300 nanometers, because diffusion and impaction have the least effect on these size particles. In contrast, some filters, known as high efficiency particulate air filters, or HEPA filters, shown in magenta, are designed to have high collection efficiency. Even for these filters, however, the lowest collection efficiency occurs for particles with a diameter of 300 nanometers, a size associated with low diffusion and inertial forces. With good design, collection efficiency of a HEPA filter is typically 99% or greater even for particles of this size. Electret filters leverage electrical forces to improve the collection efficiency of filters. In this collection efficiency curve, a filter with uncharged fibers has a collection efficiency curve resembling a poor home filter furnace, regardless of whether the particles are charged or not. If instead the fibers of the filter are charged, then performance is dramatically improved for both charged and uncharged particles. These type of filters are sold commercially under the brand name of Filtret by 3M, and also used in respirators. The same forces and phenomena dictate if a particle will transport through a tube. Big particles settle due to gravity. Small particles will diffuse due to Brownian motion. And medium-sized particles will tend to go with the flow and pass through the tube. Passing through a tube is critical in applications like particle sampling or in local exhaust ventilation ducts to avoid clogging. Transport through something is characterized by penetration, which is 1 minus the collection efficiency. So in this plot, a penetration of 100% means that all of the particles pass through or penetrate the tube. And that of zero means that all of the particles hit the walls of the tube and do not transport to the other side. Very small particles tend to diffuse to the walls, resulting in low penetration. Medium-sized particles, in contrast, like the orange particle, go with the flow and have a high penetration efficiency. Big particles settle due to gravity and wind up on the bottom walls of the tube and have low penetration again. We can now understand particle deposition in the respiratory tract, which can be thought of as a series of simple tubes. Airflow in the upper airways is fast moving with few large tubes, whereas it is very slow in the lower respiratory tract before terminating in the alveolar region. Big particles tend to impact where velocities are fast 
and the air curves like in your nose or settle due to gravity where air slows down. Medium sized particles go with the flow often being breathed in and breathed out. Small particles tend to hit the walls where dimensions are small and velocities are low because of Brownian motion. The net result is that the fraction of particles that deposit in the human respiratory system looks like a bad filter. So here we show respiratory deposition fraction, the fraction of particles that wind up depositing in the respiratory tract. Here a deposition fraction of one means that all particles deposit, whereas a deposition fraction of zero means that no particles deposit. Only about 15% of 300 nanometer sized particles deposit highlighted with a red arrow because neither diffusion nor inertia do much to move this particle size away from airflow streamlines. Thus, a particle of this size, if inhaled, is breathed back out 85% of the time. In contrast, nanoparticles deposit with higher efficiency due to diffusion. For particles larger than 300 nanometers, Inertia causes deposition to increase until about 5 micrometers. Deposition then becomes progressively lower because larger particles have sufficiently high gravity settling velocities to make them difficult to aspirate into the respiratory system. So they aren't even available to be deposited inside the respiratory system. The body has defense mechanisms to protect the respiratory tract from particles. For instance, nasal hairs prevent particles from entering the system. There are two mechanisms to clear particles if they do deposit in the respiratory system. The upper airways are lined with cilia that move mucus and any deposited particles up to where they can be swallowed. This region is known as the mucociliary escalator. In the alveolar region, a deposited particle triggers an immune response which can cause alveolar macrophages to enter the sac, engulf the particle, and then move them up to the mucociliary escalator. Here I depict macrophage recruitment in more detail. The immune response triggered by a particle deposited in the alveolar sac recruits a polymorphonuclear neutrophil from a blood capillary adjacent to the alveolus. The neutrophil differentiates to become a macrophage that engulfs the particle and transports it out of the alveolus. A false colored scanning electron microscope picture is shown at right, depicting an actual macrophage in action. The diameter of the red blood cells seen in the capillaries is about 7 micrometers in diameter for perspective. Now I'll talk about diseases that can develop when particles deposit in the lung. These adverse health effects are related to where particles deposit. Rhinitis and laryngitis are caused by particles larger than 10 micrometers that impact in the upper airways. Tracheitis, bronchitis, and bronchiolitis are caused by particles smaller than 10 micrometers that can pass beyond the head airways. Asthma and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease are caused by allergens and irritants deposited in the large airways. Cancers occur when specific types of particles, such as asbestos, cause mutations in different portions of the lung. Finally, interstitial diseases are associated with smaller particles that deposit in the deep lung. Sometimes the alveolar macrophage is unable to remove these particles, which causes the alveolus to become scarred also known as fibrotic. I'm going to talk a little bit about each of these important diseases now. In asthma, the smooth muscles of the bronchioles constrict to reduce airflow. Inflammation or excess mucus secretion can further reduce airflow. Symptoms of asthma include coughing, shortness of breath, and wheezing. Asthma is reversible, meaning that airways can return to normal with effective treatments. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COPD includes a large spectrum of diseases characterized by limited airflow, increased cough and sputum, and wheezing. Examples include chronic bronchitis and emphysema. 
In emphysema, shown in the picture at right, the walls of the alveoli become compromised, enlarging the alveoli and reducing the ability of oxygen to transfer to the bloodstream. COPD can develop from exposure to environmental tobacco smoke and a wide range of dusts, including wood dust. It is irreversible in that once your alveoli are compromised, there is no way to treat them. Inhalation fever is an acute, non-infectious, flu-like reaction to airborne exposures. Inhalation fever can result from exposure to metals, such as metal fume fever experienced by welders working on zinc-containing materials, polymers, such as Teflon flu from exposure to Teflon in air, organic dusts, such as organic dust toxic syndrome, which can occur when working in agriculture, for example. The fever-like symptoms are brought on by the body's inflammatory response and are reversible, resolving in a day or so after exposures cease. Fibrosis, or interstitial lung disease, results from the inability of a macrophage to remove a particle from the alveolar region, resulting in repeat injury, granuloma formation, and scarring. This disease typically occurs gradually over a working lifetime with progressive loss of oxygen exchange capability. Once scarring occurs, it's generally irreversible. Fibrosis is visible in chest x-rays. As shown at left, x-rays are unimpeded by normal healthy lung tissue, appearing dark black. In contrast, granulomas and scarring block x-rays so that there are white spots throughout the lung. In massive fibrosis, the lung tissue is often difficult to differentiate from bone because of the extensive scarring of alveolar tissue. The last disease I will mention is lung cancer. Lung cancer causes more deaths than any other cancer. It starts when a specific genetic mutation fuels unlimited cell growth, forming carcinomas in the lung. These growths can then metastasize, which means that the cancer spreads beyond the lung. Tumors can then form. Known agents include environmental tobacco smoke, asbestos, and radon gas. There are many suspected agents. Now I'd like to shift gears a little bit. Now that we know that there are diseases of the upper and lower airways, let's talk about occupational regulations. Occupational regulations require that particles are collected with specific sampling efficiencies called sampling criteria. These criteria are based on the behavior of particles in the respiratory system that we discussed previously. Inhalable samplers must collect only those particles that can be aspirated into the human respiratory tract. So the inhalable criterion, shown in blue, follows the respiratory deposition fraction for particles larger than 5 micrometers, or those particles that can be inhaled into the lung. The efficiency of sample collection for inhalable samplers is supposed to be 0.5 or 50% for particles 100 micrometers in size. Shown in yellow, the thoracic criterion is designed to collect only those particles that pass through the head airways, nominally smaller than 10 micrometers in size. And finally, shown in green, samplers based on the respirable criterion collect only those particles that can pass through to the deep lung, nominally those particles smaller than 4 micrometers. I want to make one very important distinction for inhalable thoracic and respirable samplers. These samplers provide exposure, not a dose metric. This figure depicts what is collected with a respirable sampler in green. It also shows what deposits in the alveolar region if a particle is inhaled via the mouth or the nose. Not all of the material collected with a sampler will be deposited. For a 300 nanometer particle, only 15% of particles deposit in the alveolar region, although we collect 100% with a respirable sampler. As a consequence, what is collected with an occupational sampler represents exposure, 
not dose. Here I provide some important examples of respirable workplace exposure limits for several different particle types found in industry. I also provide the basis for the limit and the permissible exposure limit. Recall that the permissible exposure limit is a regulatory limit set by OSHA. Examples are aluminum metal that causes pneumoconiosis, lower respiratory tract irritation, and neurotoxicity with a relatively high permissible exposure limit of 5 milligrams per meter cubed. Coal dust causes pulmonary fibrosis and lung damage, also with fairly high permissible exposure limit of 2.4 milligrams per meter cubed. Crystalline silica causes pulmonary fibrosis and lung cancer, and because of its toxicity, it has quite a low permissible exposure limit of 0.1 milligrams per meter cubed if it is 100% crystalline silica, or quartz. Many other mineral dust fall in this category because they cause pulmonary fibrosis. Importantly, all respirable standards are prescribed to prevent adverse health conditions resulting from particles that deposit in the deep lung. In this slide, I provide some examples of inhalable workplace exposure limits. Note that regulatory permissible exposure limits from OSHA are all based on total dust, not the inhalable criterion. So here, instead, I show threshold limit values from the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists, or ACGIH. Inhalable standards are prescribed for adverse conditions that develop as a result of particles that deposit anywhere in the respiratory tract but are usually associated with particles that deposit in the upper airways. Examples are oil mist that causes upper respiratory tract irritation and it has a threshold limit value of 5 milligrams per meter cubed, carbon black that causes bronchitis and lung cancer with a threshold limit value of 3 milligrams per meter cubed, elemental or organic manganese metal that causes central nervous system impairment, and because of its high toxicity, this has a relatively low threshold limit value of 0.1 milligram per meter cubed. And then finally, the last example is soluble elemental nickel that causes lung damage and nasal cancer. And that also has a relatively low threshold limit value of 0.1 milligram per meter cubed. All of these have adverse health endpoints associated with the upper respiratory tract. In summary, understanding the behavior of aerosols is key to harnessing their benefits and preventing harm from exposure to them. Particle size dictates aerosol behavior, especially movement within an environment. Particle movement dictates collection in filters, transport through tubes, and deposition in the respiratory tract. And sampling criteria for industrial hygiene is based on deposition of particles in the human respiratory tract. This lesson has been created by the Midwest Emerging Technologies Public Health and Safety Training METFAST program, a collaboration of the University of Minnesota School of Public Health, the University of Iowa College of Public Health, and Dakota County Technical College. Funding for the METFAST program is provided by the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences of the National Institutes of Health. The content of this lesson is solely the responsibility of the developers and does not necessarily represent the official views of National Institutes of Health.